Um, thank you all for being here. It's a great honor. Today I'm going to talk about structured concurrency. Um, but first I would like to uh, uh, give my thanks to a bunch of people. Uh, there's Marin, there's the author of Zero M MQ. Uh, he wrote a good uh, article about structured concurrency. There's Romanov, he's the lead uh, uh, architect of uh, Kotlin. I got introduced to Kotlin a couple of years back and uh, used a lot of the concurrency stuff and it's, it's been really good. At the time I wasn't aware of, of what it all meant, but looking back they, uh, they certainly had it covered. There's uh, Nathiel that wrote uh, the nodes and structures concurrency. Uh, that's a very good article. It also gives a good overview. And there are a bunch of names uh, from C++ proposal, P2300. And there's, there's Leith at the bottom. He actually introduced me to the, to the proposal. Um, and without him, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't give this presentation here. Um, so yeah, the last 50 years, you probably know this, this, this chart some, somewhat. Uh, the axis here is uh, logarithmic. So we've seen a huge increase in the, uh, in the amount of transistors. Frequency as well, right? Up until 2005-ish. Um, so back in those days, if you want your, your software to run faster, just wait a year to buy new hardware and it would, uh, it would go faster. But from 2005 forward, that no, no longer that no longer worked uh, because of because of hardware limitation, physical limitations. It's it's very difficult to go faster than than five gigahertz. Um, so what they did instead, they had all these transistors left, all this space. So instead of making it faster, let's just make more of those cores. Except now you can't just buy new hardware and automatically get this increase. Um, so you have to find a way how you can utilize all these extra, all these extra cores. Um, how can we do that? Well, there are two, two ways. Um, one is parallelism. When you, when you split up a, a, a CPU-bound task into, into isolated pieces, right, that don't, don't depend on each other, and then run them on, on multiple threads, or maybe on a, on a whole farm of, of PCs or whatever. Uh, it's not easy to find those isolated pieces. Some algorithms might not have them. But once you have found them, then it's pretty straightforward to, um, to execute them on multiple threads. Um, it's basically just, just a fork, execute, and then a join. With concurrency, um, you're, you're basically you basically have more I.O. bound tasks. So there's a lot of waiting involved. Instead of stalling on the thread, on the core, you decide to execute other work in between. Um, by, and and, and that, that increases the utilization of the, uh, of the processor. So another way to look at it, um, let's say I'm painting my house, right? I can do it sequential, it's just me painting it. it takes a while. Or I can get two of my friends to help out once I realize that I have three rooms. Suppose all the rooms are the same size and we all paint equally fast. Then it's going to take roughly a third of the time. And there's a concurrent way. is when you start to realize that, hey, wait a second. I paint the room for the first time, but then I have to wait until the paint is dried and then apply it a second time. right? And what do you do in that waiting period? Well, you can actually start on the second room. So you do the first room, first layer, second room, first layer, third room, first layer, and then go back to the first room. Um, that way you, you, you're utilizing the full core, and you just need one. You just need one guy executing the whole thing. It's not as fast as the par parallel one, um, but still faster than the sequential one, plus we're using just one core, right? And now suppose that instead of three rooms, there were hundreds of rooms, right? Then you can interleave things much more uh, uh, neatly and uh, clearly. And then at some point you were, you're gonna outrun the, the par parallel one because that one is, is, has moments in time where it's just waiting, waiting on things. Um, but 
The first one was rather simple, right? It's just one box. The parallel one has three and the concurrent one has six. And there's a lot of managing things, right? You gotta keep track of which room you painted and which one is next and all that stuff. Um, so that's, that's certainly more difficult. And there are bugs, plenty of bugs. You've seen in the previous talk as well. Data races, deadlock, live lock, starvation, order violation, Thomas E. violation. I won't go into all of them, but uh, I found some, some, some good papers that, that analyze a lot of uh, existing software. And, uh, and go into all kinds of uh, all kinds of bugs there are. The, the top one I found interesting because it, w it was a recent article by uh, by uh, Uber, where they go into into detail on all the all the stupid mistakes they made and all the other stuff. Um, that's very nice. If you go through the papers, you're going to see a very common theme, right? That the concurrent APIs are are too low level, right? And it's very, very easy to introduce bugs. And these bugs are not only harder to track down than just regular non-concurrency bugs, but they also can be hidden a long time, right? Uh, there, there, are, there are cases where, where a bug is hidden for years, and then suddenly, because you run it on a different computer, with more cores, different architecture, things suddenly uh, start to pop up. This was an interesting quote I found by Edward Lee, um, the problem with threads. The threads are a seemingly straightforward adaptation of the dominant sequential model of computation to concurrent systems. Many people are pushing for the increased use of multi-threading, yada, yada, yada. And in this paper, I argue that's not a good idea. Threads discard the most essential and appealing properties of sequential computation, understandability, predictability, and determinism. I would argue for the development of concurrent coordination language based on sound composable formalisms. Uh, he was right, he was right. Uh, threads are, are just too easy to use incorrectly, not to mention all the, all the synchronization primitives you have, any problems you can have there. With threads you get a lot of non-determinism, right? And you have to use all kinds of synchronizations to get the determinism back in your program. But that's all something that you as a programmer have to do and that you can uh, do wrong. So how about in D? Well, we have threats too. We have concurrency spawn. We have parallelism task, and it's vibed on retask. There's a bunch of others too. I, I, I tried Mecca and, and, and Ocean. I uh, couldn't get them to compile, but uh, they, 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 they all basically center around this, this similar idea of, uh, of spawning something and then later joining it. Uh, but there's, there's something really wrong with that API. And yeah, I'm going to go to the next slide, and just, just two words are going to change here, and I hope that can illustrate the, the problem a bit. Ready? New and delete. Did you see that? It's just the same API. Now, now, how does that make you feel, right? <laughs> do, you, do you like new and delete? Exactly, exactly. So, so, so what's exactly the problem with new and delete? Reasoning, Reasoning yeah. Anyone else? Manual memory management. Manual memory management. So you, you, you might say that you forget the delete, right? That, that might be the problem. I, I would argue that's, that, that's more of a symptom. The problem is more that that we split up resource management into two pieces. One at the beginning and one at the end. And you have to place them, different parts in your code base. And that might be in the same function, or maybe in the same file, hopefully in the same folder, but <laughs> <laughs> anything goes, right? Um, so that's a bit of an issue. So I would say the problem is not that you forget the delete, but it's, it's, it's not clear where, where to put it. Um, because they're so far apart. And you have to reason about all the stuff in between. And you have to know, when am I actually done with this thing? Right? And even when you did all the hard work and said, like, yeah, yeah, this is the place where it needs to go, 
there's no amount of evidence that you can leave behind that actually indicates that it is the correct place. N not for other people, but <laughs> also not for yourself. Right? They just have to take your word for it. And I would argue that with concurrency, with, with these spawn and, and join APIs, we have a similar problem. Um, they, 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 they split up things and then they create some sort of hidden, hidden link between them. And that ultimately doesn't scale because there's a lot of things that you have to keep uh, in your head. Um, so concurrency in D is, is too low level and it's unstructured. It, it's very easy to spawn things, but it's quite difficult to manage them. That's all pushed on the programmer. It's also, it's also not clear who owns what. If you spawn a thread that doesn't function, who owns it? Is it the runtime? Well, that's not a good answer, right? We, we want the ownership to be as small as possible. The lifetime is also unclear. Uh, with a regular function, you know that it's, that it's done when it returns, right? Any, any local it had, it's all gone. Response, and that, that's, that's not the case. Uh, error handling as well. Like I tried all the, uh, all the, all the, all the different APIs here. And not many of them do the, wrong, do the right thing. Um, many of them, they, they swallow the exception, or you only get the exception when you actually join it. So that's something that you have to build for yourself. Cancellation as well. Right? It's something that you have to add on as your own. And they're non-composable. It actually resembles unstructured programming a lot, in a way. So let's go, let's go back a couple of decades and see how that played out. This is, a, this is a, a piece of code. I don't know the language, it's Flowmatic something. I don't know if it's even real code, but it illustrates the point. Just 70 lines. Well, it's 18 run because it starts at zero. So, so, uh. But anyway, let's, let's follow them. There are a bunch of go-tos there. So on line 13, there's jump to operation two. Okay, 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 good. But there are more there, right? There, there are a lot more there. <laughs> it's, uh, just have 70 lines, but it's already incomprehensible, right? Imagine having to, to refactor this, or debug it, or add a feature. It's just, it's just madness. Now you could, you, you could argue it's just 70 lines if you spend 50 minutes analyzing it. You can probably understand what's going on. But the thing is, it's just 70 lines. What it, what's 5,000 lines? Right. It's incomprehensible. So that's, that's, that's a bit of the problem they had at the time. And the problem of increasing complexity. Many people working in the area of computing have expressed concern with the problem of software reliability. Well, the cost of hardware has decreased, as power has increased, software costs have increased and become more complex. The result is, although we can do more than before, it's at the risk of encountering more serious problems than before, and they prove to be more resistant to solutions. So this is a book from, from the introduction. This is a, a, a quote from the int introduction of structured programming. And it was that the demand for software back in the 60s grew so much Right? that unstructured programming wasn't, wasn't really cutting it any, anymore. And it was only set to grow more. So in 1966, Bohm and Jacopini, they, they came up with the structured program theorem. And they state that with just these three building blocks, you can build any computable function. Right? We, have, we have sequence. It's just executing one, one statement after the other. There's selection, which we know as, as an if and else. Right? It's a condition and two branches. And there's iteration, like while loop, for loops, that kind of stuff. So there's a condition, a statement, and then it goes back until it finally, finally exits. The, the one important aspect here is that all of these, they have, they have one entry and one exit. Right? You can't, can't just jump into the middle of things. Right? It's all uh, uh, structured. And um, these things compose. Right? 
you can build elaborate programs with it. Uh, here's an example um, of how you could do that. Now, now every, every block here can be abstracted away with just a statement. This, this large block here, for, for instance, you can just hide it and say, it's a white box, it's a statement, end of, end of the day. And if you do that, if you look at it from a high level, all you see is that it's a for loop, and then at the end of it, there's another for loop, and then a statement, and then an exit, right? Um, so, so everything can be extracted away. Um, and, and this allows you to, to encapsulate things, uh, to, to hide detail. And that means when, when done well, you can, you can increase local reasoning. Because if I, if I zoom in on one part, I, I can forget all the other stuff. I don't even have to know that it exists, right? If I can prove that one thing is correct, the other thing, then by definition, the whole, the whole thing is. Right, so that gives rise to, to local reasoning. So that you can reason about something in isolation of everything else and, and understand the whole thing. Uh, so that means that you can, can scale up your software. Right? So uh, software is easier to write since programs can be, problems can be decomposed into smaller ones. And you can understand them because you don't have to understand everything else. So again, a quote from the book, to check each module independently is an obvious advantage. The clarity, systematic nature, and alliance of controls of the independence of the module is responsible for the superiority of structured programming. It's much easier to tell when a module is being performed in a structured program. They use the word module, right? I think they use, they mean function as we know it, right? As there's only one way of getting into it and only one way of getting out to it and both the entry and the exit connect to the same higher level module. Thus, the logic is more easily followed, both with the in-between modules. You might have noticed that this, this quote is from, from 97, where, where this, this theorem was from 66. It, it took a while, right, before people caught on. And there were lots of arguments between people. When doing research, I remember uh, reading an anecdote where there were uh, the structured proponents and the unstructured proponents. And the unstructured people were, were coming up with challenges. They were basically coming up with awful unstructured codes and then throwing it to the structured guys and saying, let's see if you can structureize this. But of course they could, right? Because this thing is based on the Neumann architecture, right? It's a natural conclusion. So yes, you can formalize any, any program in these three constructs. Now today, we, we, we use more of them, right? We, we have exceptions. We still have a form of, of go-to, but it's always go-to inside the function, not go to the middle of some other function in another file. Um, that's not what you want. Um, and to, to, today, structured programming is, is just, just a norm. Right? Not in the strictest form as it was then, but I don't know any unstructured programming language. I don't use one. Well, maybe assembly or something, but you don't see that much. So structured programming is what we, what we do all day, every day, right? Um, so wouldn't it be interesting if you would combine structured programming with concurrency and then get structured concurrency. Before we do that, let, let's, let's look at the, at the cornerstone of concurrency, which is the asynchronous function. Now, an asynchronous function is just a regular function, except it's asynchronous. So it, it does all the things a regular function does, and then some asynchronous stuff. So it has arguments, right? can return a value, can throw an exception. But where a regular function would run in line, right, the control would be passed from, from the caller to the, to the callee and then passed back, an asynchronous function runs somewhere else. We don't care where, but just not, not here. Uh, also something, 
a, a normal function, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't cancel a normal function, right? Because control is being passed to it, there's nothing to cancel it. You might want to cancel your process from an OS level, but canceling a function doesn't exist. For an asynchronous function, it does, right? We want to be able to cancel them. Um, the owner in the lifetime, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. With a regular function, obviously it's the caller that owns it, right? It, it runs in its, on its stack and that kind of thing. And the lifetime of a, of a function is, is always smaller than that of a caller. That makes sense. An asynchronous function, who owns it? I don't know. What's the lifetime? I don't know. That's not, that's not good. Right? We want to control these, these two things. Um, we want to stay in, in, in the world of structured programming, right? Because it gives us so, so, so many good guarantees and it allows us to, to write large, large scale software. So about ownership and lifetime. Um, every asynchronous computation needs to have an owner. I say computation, function, task, similarly, right? Everyone needs to have an owner, like, like every single one. You can't just do things fire and forget style and just have it run detached or something. And an owner always needs to outlive all this asynchronous computation it owns. This is just like the regular pro programming, right? If you, if you call a function, then you don't just go somewhere else. Um, and this, this, this allows the, the, the control flow to be, to be clear when you're reading the code. Despite the fact that you might, I don't know, run a gazillion threads or fibers or whatever. Um, because there's always an owner, there's always a place to forward errors to. So if you have an exception in asynchronous computation, you just forward it to your owner. Just like with regular pro programming, right? Exceptions, they bubble up the stack. We, we want something similar. This, this avoids exceptions that get swallowed or ignored or stay hidden somewhere, right? We, we, we want to get them immediately. Now, but, but if an asynchronous computation would error, the owner can't just bubble the error up. It first has to make sure that all the other synchronous computation it might run are stopped and canceled before it can bubble the error up because it needs to outlive all of them, right? So if one of them has an error, it needs to cancel all the other ones before it can bubble up the thing. Um, so that means that Asynchronous computations, they, they, they need a way to be able to... Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm going ahead. Um, but just, just because you want to cancel some work, right? An owner needs to cancel asynchronous computation. Just because you want to cancel the work, doesn't mean it's done immediately. It might take a while, right? So the asynchronous computation, they, they, they need a way to be, to be able to, to signal Yes, now I'm done with canceling. Everything is done, so you can uh, continue what you're, what you're doing. Um, so to recap, everyone, every asynchronous computation must have an owner, must outlive everything they own. Errors must be propagated upwards, and the computation should support cancellation. It should support cancellation. But the other ones have must. That one is should. They, they, don't all need to support cancellation, but they probably should. It's probably better. And asynchronous computations, they need a way to signal return value, right, the normal completion, uh, an error if there's an exception, and also uh, cancellation, or that they're done with cancellation. These are a bit of the, the informal rules of structured concurrency, as I phrase them. Um, it's kind of interesting that, that that none of the APIs that we have follow them all. In fact, I would say that all of them break everything. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you're, if you're doing anything about concurrency, writing a library or wanting to build something, 
keep these things in mind, right? Because they're gonna they're gonna make make your life and the life of, of anyone who uses it uh, a lot better. Um, so now we come to the to the to the second part of the presentation. Is when we when we go to uh, go have a have a look in P twenty three hundred. Uh, the C++ pro proposal, and uh, it's a proposal for for a framework for managing asynchronous execution on generic execution contexts. That's a bit of a mouthful, but it just means threads, GPUs, special processors, that kind of thing. I have to say, I was a, I was a bit skeptical at first. Leith pointed me to this to this uh, proposal, and I read it the first time. I was like, ah. Bollocks, uh, go away. But I read it the second time, and the third time, and over the course of months, I was, uh, yeah, I was slowly getting warm to it. Right. This is what they what they say in the uh, in the introduction. Software is increasingly becoming asynchronous and parallel. Uh, they appear everywhere, from hardware interfaces, networking, filio, GUIs, accelerators, uh, GPUs, and that stuff. The standard library. Uh, has a rich set of concurrency primitives and lower level building blocks, but they lack a standard vocabulary and framework for asynchronous and parallelism. Right? They have async and future and promise, but they're inefficient and they're hard to use and they lack genericity. So then they go on to propose a, a model here with three key abstractions, right? Schedulers, senders, and receivers and a set of customizable asynchronous algorithms. Now, I would argue that the thing that they missed is the word structured. I don't see it anywhere, but it is structured, actually. The whole pro proposal is. Now, I, I won't go into, into, into a lot of detail on how senders receivers work, but we're gonna discuss some, uh, some example code that, uh, that uses them. So a sender would, would correspond to a, an asynchronous computation, right? It's something that at some point is gonna send a value, or maybe an error, or the fact that it's done canceling. And then correspondingly, there's a receiver that receives the, that value. Here you see a value sender, which sends a single value of type T. And if you look closely, it's just a struct with that one value, there's, there's no overhead, right? No allocations or other stuff. Then the other part is this, this, this connect function that takes a templated receiver and then combines it into this operational state. It's just making yet another struct, right? And then the operational state has everything it needs, right? It has the value that, that you want to send, plus it has the receiver. So now if you start it, it's gonna go set value, and that's pretty much it. So how do we use this? So I made, I made a little helper function, just. It just creates a value center. And there's a sync wait. So what we can do is we can take the sender and we can synchronously wait on it. And then, yeah, lo and behold, the value is 42. So what, what, what sync wait does is, is it calls connect on, on the just sender, which constructs the operational state it returns it to sync weight, which then starts it and then calls that value. One important thing is that, is that sync weight and, and the senders in general, they're lazy, right? They don't do anything until you connect and start them. That also means that sync weight starts and awaits it in one operation. Right? So you, we don't split up things and allow you to forget one or don't know where to put it. It's just, just one place. That might seem small, but it allows you to, to, to reason about the lifetime of a sender. Because you know that after the sync wait, it's done. It's, it's not alive. It's completely done. Before it, it hasn't started yet. Uh, but then again, you might say that Wait a second, this is not concurrency or parallelism. This is all, all on the stack, everything is in, in line. There's, there's no extra thread involved, nothing. Well, we can change that. 
we can use the, the VIA uh, algorithm, right? So we composed the Just42 sender via a thread sender. Now, thread senders are, are kind of interesting in the sense that they, they, they're, they're ultimately going to call that value on the context of a new thread. Ergo, it runs the sender on a different thread. Here's a, here's a little, little uh, representation, right? Sync weight calls thread sender connect, constructs the thread's operational state, starts that, and then the thread is going to call set value on via on the new thread, right? It's going to call connect on, on the just 42 sender, which is going to construct the operational state for that one. It's going to start the operational state, and then that's going to call set value on sync weight. So we started up a new thread. We call a function from that thread uh, uh, back into the, uh, into the sync weight. That's nice. But typically, we don't use thread sender directly. We would use something like a, like a thread pool, for instance. Or more specifically, a scheduler. Right? So we take the just 42, the sender, and we schedule it on a scheduler. And then we await the thing. Now this does the same thing, right? Except it, it, it runs on a, on a thread pool of two threads. So it's going to fire up one thread and uh, do the same thing. And one thing to note here is that the pool is scoped. Right? So once it exits the scope, the thread pool is going gonna, is gonna to clean up and kill all the threads. But it also means that once you schedule a sender on a thread pool, it's connected to the scope. So you cannot escape it anymore. You cannot return it. You cannot do it somewhere else, right? Thanks to uh, DIP1000. That's great. Uh, next up is a, is, a, is a little quiz. We're going to introduce the, the when all algorithm. The when all just takes two or more senders and runs all of them to completion. But the question is, what should happen if either foo or bar sender fails? Throw. Throw. Throw an exception. Throw an exception out of foo bar. Throw an exception. OK. I think that's good. But suppose foo failed? What, what happens with bar, the bar sender? So, so in normal programming, if we have the foo here, and it, let's say it throws an exception, bar never gets executed. Essentially, it gets canceled in a way. Although it, it doesn't really get canceled, but we can look at it from that way. So with a when all, when we're running multiple senders and one of them has an error, we want to cancel the other one. Because we can no longer run all of them to completion because one of them just, just failed. So we have to cancel the other one and then wait until it's done. And only then can we propagate the original error. So this means that, that even in the presence of exceptions and asserts and well, all that stuff, we always clean up things. We always keep things uh, uh, scoped. Um, and this is not just with when all. This is with all the algorithms in the, in the library. All of them follow these, these rules of structured programming so that you cannot have leaky tasks or things that are still running which you don't know about, but spooky behavior. That makes things for, for you as a programmer a lot easier because you can, you can reason about things a lot more better because you know both of them are going to be long gone when full bar has returned. There's no surprises there, right? Even if they spin up 100 threads on a different machine. And it's also reflected in the code, right? You can use your, your normal sequential reasoning. Um, which brings me to the concept of a narrow waste, right? Instead of, instead of writing specialized code 
for each combination of asynchronous computation and asynchronous algorithm, we want to write the asynchronous, the senders basically, just once and the algorithms just once. By, by standardizing on the, on the senders receivers uh, as a as sort of a sh glue layer, um, we can just write the sender and the algorithm separately. So on the right, you can see a couple of dozen I, uh, I wrote. So if you write a sender, you can, use, you can just use those. Right? And any ones you add, you can use on existing senders. This is the same with, with, with ranges or the ST, STL or Unix pipes or JSON or CSV, right? They connect different parts. Um, now some of these, these asynchronous algorithms, they're not easy to write, right? They do all the things that the previous talk said we shouldn't do. And maybe I should use his, uh, his rocket uh, is rock thing to uh, ensure I'm doing the right thing. But the point is, once we do that, these algorithms are, are sound, right? We can, we can prove it and then everyone can use them uh, instead of everyone rolling out their own thing and hoping for the best. Well, let's go back a little bit to, to the Fu and Bar Center and, and see if we can, can compose some more. Uh, suppose we realize that Foo Sender is a bit flaky. Now, we really don't want flaky things, but suppose it is and, and we want to deal with it. It doesn't matter what Foo Sender does, if it's a whole large thing, we can just add retry. Retry max times three. And ask the question, what happens if Bar Sender fails? Well, same thing. If Bar Sender fails, it means that when all cannot complete successfully, ergo, it has to cancel the Foo Sender even if it's in the middle of retrying or, or doesn't matter, right? Okay, that's great. So now we have a colleague and he really likes the full, full bar function, but sometimes because of the retrying, it takes too long, right? So he wants to add a timeout. Well, here you have a timeout helper that races a sender against a delay. A delay is just, just a timer, right? And what race does is it's going to forward the first one that completes after first canceling or and awaiting the other one. So by these simple algorithms, right, we can, it doesn't matter what these senders do, if they get it back at from a socket or the read from a file or, or whatever, right? We can use these, these standardized algorithms um, to, to compose the, the behavior um, that we, that, we, that, that we want. It doesn't stop there. We also have streams. Streams are kind of like uh, asynchronous ranges and they're built on top of senders and receivers. A stream has a collect function that you pass a delegate in and then it, it becomes a sender. So then you can just sync weight it and it's gonna call the delegate zero or more times and then completing the, the sender. So here it's going, to, it's going to print hello world every second, basically, right? And then never ter terminate until you press Control C. And streams, they, they, they compose as well, right? We can have the same interval stream. We do a cumulative fold or, or a scan where we increment a number every time. We can filter it, take five to list, which is kind of like an equivalent of, a, of an array on a range. And then we, we can sync weight the whole thing, and then we get all the all the numbers there. So they compose really, really well. So the conclusion is senders and receivers, uh, as in as in P2300, they follow the, the rules of structured concurrency. So that many, many of the of the nasty details of concurrency can be hidden away. And we can use these senders to build up large task graphs to sampling, uh, representing complex concurrency code. Um, there's a link to the, to the repository. I had some fun implementing this. Right, the C++ guys, they did all the hard work for, for me. I think they worked on it for 10 years or something. So I would just have to implement it. How hard can it be? I, I, I really like Safe and Dip1000. Uh, I think we need more of it. So senders, because they're just structs, they, they naturally live on the stack. 
right? And, and dip thousand helps them to not escape. Every night before bed, I pray for safe by default. Not the only one. <laughs> um, but in contrast to ranges, the concurrency library requires all delegates or functions to be passed to be safe. I don't infer uh, <coughs> safety. And the reason is type erasure. The following code doesn't compile because input range object has to be pessimistic. Because you might have created a range that has a system delegate. Ergo, the range object has to assume that it's system as well. So it is, right? This doesn't compile, it's gonna give an error. Um, I thought about it a bit and I decided, you know what, this stuff is just hard as it is. You should probably write safe code anyway. So I'm gonna make it mandatory. Any delegate you pass in or function has to be safe. Um, shared. I, I like shared, actually, for a change, right? It can be your friend, too. It helps you to express to the compiler uh, all the things that can be accessed from multiple threads, multiple execution contexts. And the compiler helps you honor that. So every delegate that's passed, uh, the user supplied delegates that passed in the concurrency library has to be shared. Why? Well, because we don't really know, and we don't really care either, where that code is going to be run, on which thread it's going to be. So all of them have to be shared. But that's a good thing, right? Because it means we can take any sender and just schedule it anywhere, in line, on a fiber, on a different thread. Plus it also highlights a lot of places in your code which have to be shared as well because they are shared, right? And this forces you to, to think a bit uh, about the possible uh, contention there. So over time, I have to, uh, I, I started to appreciate shared. This is a small example of a, a multi-producer single consumer queue. Multi-producer, multiple threads can push items, single consumers, or just one can, can, can pop them, which obviously means that you want to send it to other threads, right? So here we have a little producer function that returns a <laughs> producer that has a shared pointer to the queue. So that means that you can just shove the producer somewhere else and they can just call push on, on it. No one has to cost anything, no one has to do anything. Plus they can't move the, the queue over to another thread and start popping from there, right? So we get a little bit of, uh, little bit of extra safety. This is another one. Uh, you, you might have seen some, some web applications where you use a UDA to set up a route and then have a, have a handler function there. Uh, but if you run it from a thread pool, it kind of means that the application has to be shared, right? It does. So by enforcing that, it means that if you don't make it shared, it's going gonna, it's gonna to error. This is, this is a, a pseudocode, by the way. This doesn't actually... It's not impl implemented yet, but it enforces the shared, right? So if it wouldn't be shared, then it wouldn't run. Uh, in, the, in the summary of the presentation, also describe the way how you can get rid of all the synchronization primitives. This is an idea from uh, Theodorescu, and he introduces the concept of a serializer. So what the serializer does, it's a, it's a, it's a scheduler that only allows you to run one sender at a time. It's just like a mutex, right? So if you re represent your application as a task graph with units of work, right? You can't divide them any further and then schedule the parts that you want to have exclusive uh, execution on whichever serializer you want, then you don't have to write any logs. Now you might say, well, this is just the same thing. Well, no, it's not. It's asynchronous, right? It doesn't block any threads. It just keeps, keeps running. So if you have enough tasks that you can feed to your CPU, it's going to utilize it. Uh, a lot. Um, the future. Well, there are some places that, that require more threat safety. Uh, there's also a nasty back pressure problem in nested streams. But those are just things that we have to have to fix. I want to integrate it with fibers some more. Some people don't really like the nestedness what you, what you get. So uh, by, by integrating with, with, with uh, fibers, you can get you know, the normal uh, 
normal flow. Event loops as well, scheduler, asynchronous algorithms. Probably good docs and tutorials on how to write custom senders. Um, they're not simple, but they are in one file. They are in one place, right? So the start, the cancellation, the error handling, it's all in one, one little place. And then maybe something like a task local garbage collector, right? Because you know how long they run and after they're done, you can just throw away all the, uh, all the stuff there. That's it. All right, uh, question times now. And we have one from a Discord from Ricky. Uh, do we need an attribute to disable TLS access to allow moving fibers between threads for such a concurrency model? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, TLS by default, maybe it was a mistake, I don't know. Um, but it's, it makes it difficult, right? If, you, if you're gonna move set fibers across threads, uh, what do you do with that? I don't know, I don't know. All right, well, Walter's got a question. Well, I think by definition, you cannot move TLS data, <laughs> a, a reference to TLS data across thread. That defeats the entire purpose. Sure, of sure. Yeah, in general, I would say don't use thread local data. <coughs> don't use globals, don't use thread locals. They're just globals, right? So, yeah. yeah. Generally, you're better off if you stick with pure functions. <laughs> no globals. I agree. Um, aren't you a bit limited by shared, given its current state in the language? Mm, not really. Because it doesn't catch a lot of errors. Like? Like, uh, currently we do a lot of things in, in Phobos uh, that are uh, completely unsafe uh, from a concurrency point of view, but uh, we gladly allow it. For example, Parallel is terrible. Yeah. Um, I don't have an answer for that, but I still want to use the keyboard, right? And then fix that, all those things. Because I, th I think it makes a lot of sense to have, have something that indicates, hey, this is shared. Um, I agree. I, I was just hoping for a list of issues to fix. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find many problems, though. Uh, but maybe those will, those will appear at some point. Uh, this isn't a question, just a comment, but at the... I'm going to repeat myself. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Super. There's one more. Uh, what is the semantics for consolation? It's at the composition points only. Like, you cannot interrupt uh, regular code, right? Sorry? Uh, so you have a cancel operation timeout and stuff, so it can interrupt this uh, task graph only at composition points, not, you cannot interrupt with a like regular function. Uh, I, did, I didn't talk so much about this, but, but it has, uh, it uses stop tokens, right? So it, it's a responsibility of the sender to, to, uh, to hook into these stop tokens, either by checking them regularly or by setting a callback on them. And uh, a sender should, right? but sometimes it's not, it's not uh, possible. Does that answer your question? Uh, kind of, I, I, I mean, I'm not sure what is stop tokens. Uh. It is, it's, a, it's a stop token. So it's kind of like an object that, that you can query whenever the task or group of tasks needs to be canceled. It's basically glorified Boolean, right? Mm -hmm. But so it means when I'm writing the code that is getting executed by uh, like in, inside of this framework or uh, run by the scheduler, I have to put uh, special checks that are checking for these stop tokens you can, in my code. You can check, but you can also set a callback. No, okay. 
kind of bed. Yeah. So, so a very naive example is while running and then do whatever you want to do, right? But sometimes that's not possible. So that's why there's a, there's a callback. So you can register a callback on the stop token whenever part of the thing is going to be canceled, that callback is going to be called. Now you don't have an obligation to also actually cancel. I mean, there might be a race where you're completing and you're, and you're canceling. And it's OK if you just complete regularly. Um, um, but yeah, if, if you want to prompt shutdown, then you should, should honor these, these uh, stop tokens and, uh, and set up uh, callbacks or, or query, query them. Yeah. But my, my question is kind of similar. I'm not sure I understood, but how, so you start, a, you start some, some tasks, some code. How do you preempt that code? Let's say you, you start a function that does a while true do nothing. How do you preempt that? I, I, I don't write those functions. <laughs> <laughs> that was an oversimplified version, but how do you? Well, well, well you, can, right? you, can, you can run it. If, it, if it's a CPU intensive task, right, then, then you, you wouldn't run it on the same pool that you would with all the other stuff. You might want to run it on a separate thread or separate thread pool. Um, but you do, have to, you do have to listen to these cancellation points. Otherwise, uh, how can you cancel it? it? It's just like a regular pro programmer. You spin up a thread that does something. How do you cancel it? Well, um, you could send a message. You send a message. Like a signal, yeah, signal. exactly. It's the same thing. Yeah. Except it's, it's, it's in the framework, right? So everything uh, has that feature. Well, if it's in a separate thread, you could kill the thread, and that would kill the process or all the function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's also possible. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> All right, I think we've got time for one more question if someone's got a good one. It's got to be a good one. Here, Walter's got a hand up. That'd be a good one. The pressure's on, man. Del please deliver. <laughs> well, I think the idea of composability seems so obvious. Why did it take, what, 30 years to come up with composability for? Um, multi-threaded code. Uh, do you have any? Uh, um, do you know why it takes so long before this happens? Why are Why are we, uh, or is the computing community as a whole going around the horn and finally coming back to where they should have started from, which was composability? Yeah, it's a good question. I I I don't have a good answer to that. Um, I think I think there have been some some competing ways of doing concurrency, right? Um, but we kind of got hooked on the whole threads for some reason. Because I, maybe it's just easier to just spin up a thread and run stuff there. Um, I don't know. I certainly never thought of it either. <laughs> it, it's me, ne me neither. And, and, um, and it took these guys like 10 years to come up with this. It's, it's actually, once you understand it, it's pretty simple. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's one of those amazing things where, like, you know, ranges and algorithms, or in the earlier version was iterators and algorithms, is once you see it, it all seems so obvious. But it completely escaped me and most everyone else. Yeah. So I, I think it's brilliant. Well, all credits go to other people, right? not me. I just make this presentation. Although I implemented the library, that wasn't cer 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 certainly wasn't easy. But well, uh, since uh, a lot of the C++ work on libraries is done using the Boost license, um, wouldn't that have made it easier to uh, uh, basically copy the way they did it? Because if it's Boost license, it allows us to do that and save you a lot of grief trying to reinvent it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if, it, if it's easy to interface with it. Also, the code is, uh, well, longer. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can compare them side by side and then make up your own, your own mind. Although in C++, they, they might have a little bit more uh, features in terms of, of R value, move semantics, and that kind of stuff. Um, but the D version is surprisingly 
simpler, I think. Yeah. Well, that, 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 that's great. <laughs> I like that. All right, and uh, we're done here. Give it up again for Sebastian. Good. Thank you.